Chapter 8, Cognition and Intelligence. This is Lecture 2. Basic questions we're going to be looking at. What is intelligence? When and by whom did intelligence testing begin? What does a score on a modern intelligence test mean? How do we know modern intelligence tests actually measure intelligence? Do IQ scores predict academic and job success? How do Sternberg and Gardner's theories of intelligence differ from the conventional academic performance view? Does heredity affect intelligence? Are there racial differences in IQ? What's the explanation? So I imagine that many of you have come into this class having some presuppositions about what intelligence is. It's something to consider every now and then. What is this stuff called intelligence that some people seem to have more of than others? What is it? I think the conventional view is intelligence has to do with school smarts. That's sort of the received view of what intelligence is, has to do with academic performance and so forth. Uh, really smart people do well in school. And not so smart people end up digging ditches, whereas really smart people have these very high status careers and so forth. So kind of a narrow view of intelligence, but I suspect that this is sort of the received view, the, the most common perspective on intelligence. But you're going to learn that it's a bit more than that. So the history of psychology is replete with attempts to measure intelligence and then correlate it with other important stuff in life. So we're going to begin with the first attempts to measure this stuff called intelligence. So I'm going to read you a quote from Binet and Simon's Initial attempt to measure intelligence. These were the first individuals to measure intelligence in a systematic way. It seems to us that in intelligence there is a fundamental faculty, the alteration or lack of which is of the utmost importance for practical life. This faculty is judgment, otherwise called good sense, practical sense, initiative, the faculty of adapting oneself to circumstances. A person may be a moron or an imbecile if he's lacking in judgment, but with good judgment he can never be either. Indeed, the rest of the intellectual faculty seem of little importance in comparison with judgment. So what Binet and Simon are saying is that this practical intelligence, this ability to adapt and adjust to novel circumstances, common sense, practical sense, motivation, is sort of at the core, being able to make the right choice at the right time. And that kind of makes sense. Uh, so, measuring intelligence, very brief history here. Binet and Simon were the first to develop an intelligence test used in schools in France back in the early 1900s. So, even though that first quote suggests the, that intelligence is this unitary phenomenon, uh, Binet and Simon actually stressed the remarkable diversity of intelligence, that, uh, but they held judgment to be sort of the, the height of intelligence, or the sort of the centerpiece of intelligence. So, in the early 1900s, the government of France determined that kids 6 to 14 must go to school. And so this presented an issue for school administrators and teachers. All of a sudden, you had all these kids in classes that uh, had varying levels of ability and aptitude and so forth, and so what to be done. Uh, how to sort kids into groups so that Everybody can be uh, have their needs best met. So Binet and Simon developed a test that measured intelligence, quantified it, and was used to sort out the subnormals from the normals, so-called subnormals from the normals. And this was useful. It was a useful bureaucratic tool because it freed teachers up to focus on who they uh, thought were best suited to do well with the current curriculum and then uh, the subnormals would need some adjustments in the curriculum to best suit their needs. So that was the idea, to, to use it as a, a bureaucratic or administrative tool, but also as a tool to fit a person to curriculum. Uh, and this test was known as the Binet-Simon Intelligence Scale. And here's some sample questions. Certainly there was lot, many, many questions on this test. We're just going to look at a couple. Uh, test item for a supposed normalcy of a four-year-old. Here's a question you ask a four-year-old. Are you a little boy or a little girl? A normal 
child of that age will identify correctly their sex? A subnormal would say yes, which is really a non-answer. An example five-year-old test is copying the square. So the idea is that you'd give a child a square to copy, and then you'd see what they produce. So this would probably be a normal. This would be subnormal. And this is a task that involves coordinating sensory input into a motor, motor skills, which seemingly is important to tap with respect to intelligence. More difficult questions. My neighbor has been receiving strange visitors. He's a, he has received in turn a doctor, a lawyer, and then a priest. What is taking place? So here, the idea is sort of imagining in an abstract way, sort of a, hypothet a hypothetical case scenario that would require a doctor, a lawyer, and a priest. So this is requiring more with respect to abstract thought. Um, so a normal child might say, well, there's been a death in the family, or a subnormal might not be able to make any sense out of what's going on whatsoever. So initially, this quantification came in the form of what was called mental age. And so the results of the Binet-Simon test were, would give a score called mental age, and then that mental age was compared against chronological age. So there were mental ages that most kids within a particular age range would be, would be scoring. So intelligence could be parsed into normal, above normal, and below, below normal. So I want to talk about what would qualify somebody as being in one of those categories based on the, the mental age, interpret, interpretation of mental age. So uh, we would talk about a normal person as, for example, a 15-year-old with the mental age of a 15-year-old. Somebody who's above normal would be a 10-year-old with the mental age of a 15-year-old. Below normal would be a 15-year-old with the mental age of a 10-year-old. So this is how educators had conversations about their students with respect to their intelligence, which was kind of a clunky way to go about doing it. Uh, then subnormals were further, further categorized as idiot, imbecile, or moron. And these were words that were actually used in conversing about students' intellectual ability. So idiots were the lowest, imbecile was in intermediate, and then morons were the state nearest normality. Then the next iteration, Lewis Terman, Lewis Terman at Stanford took the Stanford Binet or the uh, Binet Simon test and adapted it uh, for use in the U.S. and created the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. He also adopted the idea of the intelligence quotient, which is where we get IQ. And this innovation made it easier to have conversations about students' intelligence. So all IQ is this. Uh, we have the mental age that's given by the test, and then we divide it by the chronological age and then multiply by 100. So again, this changes how we're able to have conversations about students with respect to their, their intelligence relative to other students. So a normal kid would be a 15-year-old with a mental age of 15. Multiply that by 100. And so we have 1 times 100, 100. So somebody who's normal has an IQ of 100. Above normal, we have a 10-year-old with a mental age of a 15-year-old. Multiply or divide, multiply by 1.5, or excuse me, multiply by 100, and we get uh, an intelligence quotient of 150. Below normal, we have a 15-year-old with the mental age of a 10-year-old. Multiply that by 100, and we get 67. So the idea is this. Normal for everybody, no matter what their age was, was 100. So we could speak about and compare, about, compare students using this common standard. 100 is normal, so anything above 100 is above normal. Anything below normal is below 100 which was a useful innovation. It just really took a lot of the awkwardness and communication out of it. It was more, it, it put all the scores on the same scale. And then Wexler came along, David Wexler came along in the 50s and developed 
the Wexler Intelligence Scales, that is the WACE, which is the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, and the WISC, which is the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. And these are the most commonly used intelligence scales today. Certainly they've been modified over time, but these are the ones that are most commonly used today to measure intelligence in adults and children. Wexler's innovation was to divide the concept of intelligence into two main areas, verbal and performance. And we saw a little bit of that in the in the uh, Bine Simon, where there was the copying the square task along with other verbal tasks. So Wexler sort of separated everything out into verbal and performance. And he also innovated, made some innovations with respect to scoring, which we'll talk about in a minute. But we'll talk about the, the scales here. So these two separate verbal and performance scales, I'm just giving examples here. Uh, it's a rather large test, but um, for the verbal scales, we have information, for example, 29 questions. So this is a measure of general knowledge, like what's the capital of France, that sort of thing. Uh, vocabulary, defining 35 words, a measure of expressive word knowledge. Then we have the performance scales. Uh, one of the performance scales, arranging pi pictures, these pictures are on little pieces of cardboard, and then the task is to arrange them into some sort of logical sequence, like a, uh, frames in a, par a cartoon uh, that makes sense, tell a story. And then block design, that's what we're looking at here. So there's a book, a booklet with images that the task is to reproduce those images using the blocks. So that's block design. So there's a number of different other additional verbal and performance skills, but these are just examples. Uh, so what you do is you get a score for verbal and you get a score for performance, and then you get a combined score, which is the overall uh, I, uh, overall score for the uh, for the Wexler test. Um, how we interpret the score on the Wexler test? So Wexler also did away with the quotient scores of the older intelligence test. So no more dividing mental age by chronological age, time, multiplying by 100, none of that. Um, so the modern scoring is based on what's called the normal curve model, which is the, the bell curve, which some of you may be familiar with. But let's take a look at what this curve is. What this is, is a frequency distribution of intelligence scores in the population. That is, what fraction of intelligence scores are, and let's look at the bottom here, um, and here we have a range of 55 and below, uh, and then 40, 145 and above, and then everything in between. So the idea is that we capture what fraction of the adult population are scoring uh, at or between these ranges of scores. So if we look at it, let's start right in the middle. So 100 is the average. That means uh, most adults are scoring around 100 on the the WACE. Uh, most kids are scoring 100 on the WISC. And then we have what's called the standard deviation. This is why it's referred to as deviation IQ. Think of the standard deviation as a statistic that we can use to generate a range that we can say is normal intelligence. We won't go into the computations of the standard deviation, just understand it as a unit of measurement that allows us to generate a range that we can say normal IQ falls within this range. So the standard deviation is 15. So that means we take 100 and we can add and subtract 15 from it to come up with a range of 85 and 115. And it was within this range, these values included, that we can say uh, is normal intelligence. So if the question is, how do we interpret modern intelligence Quote, uh, IQ scores, we interpret it using the IQ score distribution here, the normal curve. 100 is normal, or excuse me, 100 is the mean, and then the standard deviation is 15, so normal is somewhere between 85 and 115. So that means if you score above 115, you're above normal. If you score below 85, you're below normal. So most adults will score somewhere between 85 and 115. Children as well. Which of the following IQ scores reflect normal IQ for a 10-year-old according to Terman's Stanford Binet formula? Answer is C, 100. Mental age, 
divided by chronological age times 100. Which of the above is normal intelligence according to Wexler's deviation IQ? 10 out of 10, 75, 100, or 125? Answer is, this is a trick question, none of the above. Normal includes a range, 100 plus or minus 15. So normal intelligence is 85 to 115, inclusive. All right, so let's talk about these, uh, this Wexler test, reliability and validity. So reliability and validity are two things we want to know something about when we're talking about uh, a measure. In this case, it's the, uh, the intelligence tests are supposed to measure intelligence, and they're supposed to to measure it reliably. So let's talk about reliability first. So reliability of a test has to do with how consistent the scores are. One way that we assess reliability is through test, retest reliability. That is, if I give a IQ test, if I give the WISC to a child at eight years old and I give the test again at nine years old, I would suspect that if the test was reliable, those scores would be highly correlated. Same thing with adults. If I give a 21-year-old the, the WACE and I give that same 21-year-old the same test when they're 25, I would expect the scores to be highly correlated, around the same. When actual studies have done the test, retest reliability on, on IQ scores, that is the, the WACE and the WISC, they're highly reliable. Uh, test retest correlations are in the high 90s, which means they're almost exactly the same. So that means if you score 100 as an 18-year-old, you'll probably score 100 when you're 30. Validity has to do with a test measuring what it's supposed to measure. So IQ tests, like the Wexler test, are supposed to measure this stuff called intelligence. One of the ways that validity is assessed is through what's called test of predictive validity. That is, the test should correlate with other measures related to intelligence. So if we think intelligence is something that we've measured accurately, then people that score high on that intelligence test could, should also score high on other things that we think are associated with intelligence, like how well you do in school. So studies that have done Tests of predictive validity have discovered that correlations are moderately positive, that is, in the 0.5s with grades. So IQ tests are considered to be valid predictors of academic performance. What else do we have here? Correlations with occupational attainment are also positive and moderate strength. So 0.5 is strong to moderate. Uh, so around the same. And what that means is that we would expect to and actually probably find higher IQs among brain surgeons than we would among people who dig ditches for a living. Not to say that there aren't some very, very smart ditch diggers, but generally speaking, those high status occupations, doctors, attorneys, and so forth, are associated with higher IQs than people in the lower status occupations. One thing I need to add, though, is that IQ is not highly predictive of performance within jobs. And what this means is that suppose we look at the population of attorneys that have relatively high IQ, relative compared to ditch diggers. However, as we can imagine, some attorneys are highly proficient, they're very good at what they do, and then some attorneys uh, should be drummed out of the business. That is, they, they, they're, they're awful. They're horrible attorneys. So what this is saying is that, generally speaking, high IQs are concentrated among the higher status professions like attorneys. However, when we look at the actual performance of individual attorneys, it's not highly predictive of how well uh, a particular attorney is going to do their job. So concept check for us here, which of the below best illustrates the relation between IQ and job performance? A, most attorneys have high IQs, but some attorneys are definitely better than others. Most attorneys have high IQs, so any one of them is about as good as any other. C, attorneys have higher IQs than ditch diggers. D, some ditch diggers have higher IQs than attorneys. 
The answer is A, because we're talking about job performance. We know that job status, higher IQ among higher status occupations than lower status. But performance within job, IQ is not a good predictor of actual performance on a job. So consider this. Another quote by Einstein, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. So consider what this quote means. What is Einstein trying to convey to us? What he's trying to convey is that if we hold everybody to the same sort of standards of intelligence and behavior, then certainly we're going to be dis disappointed in others and others are going to be disappointed in themselves. So the idea with respect to our conversation here about intelligence is that maybe maybe there's different ways to be smart. So from the beginning, the focus has been on academic smarts early on, both uh, as a way to sort and track kids according to their abilities and aptitudes to serve the purposes of school bureaucrats, but also to help teachers deliver kids a curriculum that's best suited to their uh, talents and aptitudes and so forth. Um, so the focus has been primarily on academic abilities with respect to intelligence testing. A couple of criticisms of this. Robert Sternberg, who is kind of a big name in psychology, suggests that maybe there's different types of intelligence that are important and, and have been overlooked. Howard Gardner, and we're going to look at some of his multiple intelligences, basically saying that there's all kinds of different ways that we can be smart. So we're going to look at these two critics. So Sternberg advanced the triarchic theory of successful intelligence. So conventional analytical intelligence is school smarts. That is academic performance and so forth, which has been the focus of most IQ testing. And is the basis of most of our preconceptions about what it means to be intelligent. Add to this, according to Sternberg, practical and creative intelligence. So think of practical intelligence as sort of what uh, Binet and Simon were suggesting right at the very, very beginning of this lecture, that the sort of the height of intelligence, according to them, was this ability to uh, use good judgment under any circumstances. So practical intelligence you can think of as sort of advanced street smarts being able to sort of sort out whatever your situation is so that you can adapt and, and succeed in that situation. And then creative intelligence is, again, thinking outside the box. Uh, I want to remind you of the previous lecture where we were talking about some of the barriers to effective problem solving. And there was the example of unnecessary constraints. That is, you were to connect uh, a block of nine dots with four lines without going through, uh, with going through each dot once. And I pointed out that the divergent thinking that is thinking outside the box is extending the line down below. I hope you remember this because I'm talking about this in the abstract. But, but anyway, creative intelligence you can think of as having that capacity to not get hung up by unnecessary constraints, being able to think divergently come up with creative solutions, new solutions to, to new problems, and possibly new solutions to old problems. So these two intelligence that Robert Sternberg is saying are of practical significance and theoretical significance with respect to the conversation about what intelligence is and how we measure it. Then we have Howard, Howard Gardner's Eight Intelligences, and we're not, I'm not going to read through all these. You can certainly read through them. But a couple I want to point out. Uh, musical intelligence, for example. When I asked you the question at the very, very start of this lecture, what, what is intelligence? Some of you may have come up with maybe musical. There's people that are incredibly talented, musicians and body kinesthetic intelligence, uh, dancers and athletes that can do these incredible things. Some of you may have come up with those as ideas or presuppositions about what intelligence is. Um, but what Gardner has done in his theory is sort of articulate and come up with ways to measure these various intelligences. A uh, couple other ones I want to point out, interpersonal and intrapersonal. Interpersonal intelligence is really 
having the ability to detect moods and temperaments and motivations of other people. You can think of it as social intelligence, whereas intrapersonal is having the ability, the capacity to really look inward and be in touch with one's feelings and thoughts and so forth. Uh, so uh, somebody with interpersonal intelligence is probably very good uh, as a therapist because they're in tune with what other people are thinking and feeling, salespeople possibly. Um, and then intrapersonal, the philosophers and so forth, uh, having some insight, being able to look inward and, and possibly use that information to make positive changes in one's life and so forth. So there's all these different ways we can be intelligent, according to Howard Gardner. So concept check for us, which of Sternberg's three types of intelligence, conventional, creative, practical, corresponds with the type of intelligence measure, measured by the Wechsler test? Conventional. So the Wechsler test measures best how well we do in school. It correlates best with that sort of conventional notion of intelligence. Academic. Analytical. Second one here. Whom do you think would tend to be higher in interpersonal intelligence as described in Gardner's theory? A. A software engineer. B. A politician. C. A mechanic. D. A plumber. B is probably the most correct, a politician they're out there interacting with people, adjusting themselves and so forth so that they can get out the vote. Um, software engineers, certainly, I'm not saying that software engineers can't be interpersonally intelligent or plumbers or mechanics, but they tend to want to work uh, with machines and motors and pipes and code as opposed to with people. That's probably why they do what they do. So finally, nature, and actually not finally, second to finally, uh, nature and nurture. So one of the burning questions is, is born or made, is intelligence something that we come into the world possessing, or is it something that we acquire through our experience in the world? And so the answer is, it's complicated. Uh, certainly some of what we call intelligence comes from genetics, and then the rest of it is acquired through our experience and then ultimately it's the interaction between the genotype that we possess and the environment that we find ourselves in that ultimately supports the extent to which uh, we are intelligence, intelligent as measured on the Wechsler scale. So it's a complex interaction between genetics and environment that produces our level of intelligence. So I want to talk just briefly about the inherited nature of intelligence. Um, so you're going to read about twin studies that were, were done. And uh, what we're going to do is take a look at this image. On the bottom here, our mean correlation in intelligence. That is, if we take uh, individuals' intelligence test scores, for example, we have identical twins reared together with 100% genetic overlap, they share the same genes. What do we see in terms of correlation of their IQ scores? Darn near 0.9. So what this means is that one twin has almost the same IQ twin or IQ as their other twin. Uh, identical twins wear it apart. What do we see happening to mean uh, correlation? It goes down substantially. So why do we have this disparity between identical twins reared together and identical twins reared apart? Well, the simplest answer is that identical twins reared to together not only have the same genes, but they share a similar environment. And then the identical twins share the same genes, certainly, but they have, in some cases, quite different environments. So what the evidence here is suggesting is this, that there's some component of intelligence that's inherited, but yet there's also a component that is a function of environment. And we see this in this graph. So what we're seeing here is as genetic overlap decreases, what do we see happening to mean correlation in intelligence? It's decreasing as well. So the farther apart we get genetically, the lower and the lower 
uh, the mean correlation intelligence becomes. So at this point, they're very extremely dissimilar. Cousins root apart, there's almost no correlation whatsoever. So this is suggesting both a role of heredity and environment in IQ. So you're going to read about heritability. It's a bit tricky of a concept. It's a tricky concept, but I want you to think of uh, heritability as this. So if I have a class of 100 students and I give them all IQ tests, the WEX, I give them all the WACE, do you, would, do you, would you expect that every single of those 100 people would score exactly the same on the WACE? Hopefully you're saying no. That is, we would expect some variability in IQ scores in that group of individuals. That is, not everybody's going to score the same. So those are individual differences that we call variability. And they can be measured, summed up in a single value. And we call that variability. So then the question becomes, how do we explain that variability? What makes people different, really? That's what psychology is all about, is in analyzing that variability. Individual differences. What is the source of individual differences? And so what heritability estimates for intelligence do is measure intelligence and then tries to parse or discover the sources of that variability. And so what we're seeing here are estimates for how much variability is attributable to genes and how much is attributable to environment. So on the, on the left here is the high estimate. So some estimates say 80% of variation in intelligence is determined by heredity. So those individual differences are explained by differences in genetics. And 20 is 20% 20 of that variability is determined by the environment. Where over here we have the low estimate, it's 40, 60. The received view or the consensus estimate is around 50%. Uh, so what this means is that in, in the population of adults, uh, what fraction of the IQ in that population is attributable to their gen genes? 50%, the other 50% is an environment. And I want to make one caveat here is that we cannot look at ourselves as individuals and say, oh, I've got 50% of my IQ from my parents and 50% from my environment. It doesn't work like that at the level of the individual because we see individual differences. It could be that in some uh, genes are playing a much greater role in their IQ test score than their environment. And we see this. Uh, but what's true for most people is what you're seeing here. Uh, so her herit heritability estimates apply only to populations or large groups of individuals, not to individuals per se. Then the last thing I want to talk about quickly here are controversies uh, race and IQ has been the longest running controversy probably in the discipline. So what we see here in this graph are average IQ scores for various racial and ethnic groups. So let's start over here. The blue, we have the East Asian. So if we start at the peak of the curve and go down, so they're, they're above 100, and then we have whites following them. Uh, somewhere around 100, and then we have Hispanics and Blacks that are scoring uh, somewhere below 100 reliably. So this is kind of the ranking Asians, Whites, Hispanic, African Americans, and this has been a pretty reliable finding in studies that have measured race differences in IQ. All right. So the question is not if there are differences, the question is why. And that's really been where most of the controversy has, has arisen from, is how some people explain these differences in IQ score. Uh, so one explanation is the tests are not valid. That is, we're dealing with different cultures and so forth, and uh, we need to measure intelligence in culture-specific ways. So the tests are not valid. That's why we see these differences. Um, culturally biased tests. Uh, economics has been another one, so looking at the social economic status of the different racial groups, that's been another explanation that is, if you take people coming from low status or poor, poverty-ridden uh, environments and cultures and compare them against uh, uh, 
environments where there's uh, affluence and everybody has their needs met and most of what they want, then we're going to see these differences. Uh, and then genetics, this has been the most controversial that is explaining race differences in terms of uh, genetic differences across racial groups. And this has been the most controversial, particularly because what we see, uh, and we'll just look at the, uh, the black population here, scoring around 15, 15 points, reliably around 15 points lower than whites, so blacks and whites. This is, you know, your, your typical uh, racial divide here. Um, so some people have used that uh, and argued that, um, you know, biology is destiny because, and this started back in the early 1900s when there was uh, blatant racism and blatant and attempts to segregate schools uh, on the basis of, of, of these findings um, and that nothing could be done about it uh, to enrich uh, individuals' environments, to bring them up to speed and so forth. So we, we, we might as well just um, accept things the way they are. This is the way nature made us and all that. So genetics, genetic, explaining racial differences in IQ uh, in terms of genetics has been the most controversial for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but what I'm going to advance here, and this is in your text, that uh, there's, there's other environmental explanations that would seem to be perfectly adequate. Um, there, there is no good evidence to suggest at least uh, at the level of consensus among people that study this sort of thing, that uh, there's a genetic basis. Other uh, environmental explanations have been advanced that also s s seem to have explanatory power. So I'm going to talk about this one advanced by Leon Kamen. Uh, Leon, Leon Kamen. Um, so what we have here is a real interest in between group differences in IQ, right? Racial differences in IQ. So how do we explain those, those differences? Well, suppose we have two sacks of seed. We put uh, one sack of seed in less fertile soil, and we put the other seed in more fertile soil, and then we let the corn grow. So let's take a look at the corn. So uh, let's just look at the between group differences first. So we see that this corn is much taller and more robust than this corn. So how do we explain that? On the face of it, we can say, well, if you put the same seed, that is, it's just in two different sacks, we put uh, the same seed in fertile soil as a, compared to less fertile soil, we would expect a, a better crop. So you can think about IQ in the same way. That is, if you put one group of people in a, an impoverished environment, you're going to expect to see uh, certain... Uh, limitations being opposed upon those individuals' development because of those circumstances. Whereas you look at a, an area that's affluent, and, and certainly there are school districts that you can compare one against the other, and certainly some have more than others with respect to access to resources and support and everything else, you're going to see remarkable differences. All right, so that's kind of the, the take-home point. We're so hung up on the, the between-group differences when they can be fairly readily explained by the, the environmental differences of these individuals. And one more thing that I want to add is, is this, that um, if you look at the variability within each group, you see the same within groups variability across these groups. So what that means is that among, let's say, whites over here, 15 units higher than blacks norm, normatively, uh, you see the same individual differences. So we have some people with very high IQ and some people with very low IQ. Same thing over here with African Americans. Some African Americans have very high IQ, some have very low IQ. You see, see the same sort of variability within groups. What we've gotten hung up on in on is the between groups differences. That can be, on the face of it, readily explained by differences of environment. Now, some studies will argue that they've statistically controlled for environment, that is, they've looked at economic, socioeconomic class, controlled for that statistically, and, and yet you still see the differences. And that's where the, the ethnic or the racial uh, explanations come into play. But the, the fact is that there's, there's no good evidence at this point. There's no to support a consensus that there are racial differences that impact IQ performance. 
Learning Objectives. Summarize the contributions of Binet and Simon, Terman, and Wexler to the evolution of intelligence testing. Explain the meaning of an individual's score on an IQ test using Terman's method as well as the meaning on a modern intelligence test using Wexler's deviation IQ method. Discuss the reliability and validity of modern intelligence tests. Describe how well IQ scores predict academic and vocational success. Describe Sternberg and Gardner's theories of intelligence and how they differ from the conventional academic performance view. Describe evidence on whether or not heredity affects intelligence. Discuss proposed explanations for racial differences in IQ. And then we have a red font objective. Discuss the concept of heritability and summarize research that shows how heredity and the environment interact to affect intelligence.